on the key issues, and, uh, and uh, his spirit still lives as the Peace Corps, and uh, his leadership in space, uh, his leadership he understood. He was, his Harvard thesis was while England slept. How many presidential candidates ever wrote a, a bestseller at the age of 20? But it's just the idea that he, he understood the big picture, I and mean, he even, even that his father was on the other side of the issue. Um, his, uh, the way he dismissed Johnson in the film that you saw there, he said, you're referring to someone else, obviously not me. <laughs> and, and his phone call to the King family, now, I mean, they're pretty, pretty powerful uh, attributes. And that's why I think, uh, there's some of the reasons why I think that he, he was a great president and uh, what I saw in this film. I've watched this video well probably three times now I think it's it's really very striking in uh, and what 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 I thought one of the things I thought was very striking about it was that uh, as you look at uh, at the ages of the main players in this uh, in this campaign in 1960 and going forward there was not a huge gap in age at all. Johnson was born in 1908. Kennedy, or Nixon was born in 1913. Kennedy was born in 1917. They were all you know, you know, within a space of nine years. However, one, it really seems as though Kennedy is a totally different generation from both Nixon and Johnson. Two, what was really remarkable about Kennedy and what made him able to uh, be successful was that he really grasped well before uh, the rest of the uh, national politicians that things were changing, that uh, the old ways of winning elections and uh, getting the message out just weren't going to work anymore. And one of the things that made him so successful was, uh, was his ability to do that. And one scene that really strikingly that struck both me and my wife as we were watching it the other night was the 1956 uh, scene at the convention where uh, the, the Democratic candidates, Adlai Stevenson and Estes Scafaver, were up there on the platform. You say, These guys are clearly a pre television slate. These guys are not picked for, for their looks or their glamour. Estes Kefauver's wife is out there, up there on the stage, not the uh, glamorous uh, first lady that uh, Jack, Jacqueline Kennedy was. And uh, I think that, uh, as Kennedy said in his inaugural address, the torch has been passed to a new generation. He was clearly among all of these people, whether whatever you think of how successful he was, he was clearly the person who was had a progressive view of his own role in the country and the uh, the country's role in the world. Um, Senator Doyle, oh, it's always a. We've been friends for a long time, and I just want to uh, tell you how much it means to me to sit on on a panel with you, sir. Thank you. Likewise, about you. Yeah. Um, let me tell you about my party politics because I think that will inform uh, my views. Uh, my mother always voted Republican. My grandfather always voted Republican. Um, 
I was in college. My father uh, had a friend whose name was Tom Mason. Uh, I hope I'm right about this. He invented the uh, the gasket. You slammed the door of the car mm -hmm. and the gasket. <laughs> the story, the family story was he invented the, the, that gasket <laughs> and made a great deal of money. He was the uh, he was the chair of the Harvard Committee in, Ca in California. And uh, as a sophomore at uh, a very small church-related college in Elsa, Illinois, called Principia College, my father encouraged me to transfer to Harvard. And he made a quick call to Tom Mason, who made a quick call to Dana Cotton, who sat on the admissions committee at Harvard. And I got to fly to Boston and interview with Dana Cotton. A very short interview, I might add, probably about 10 minutes. And I transferred to Harvard. I was accepted. I had the grades. And I was uh, frothing him from Missouri. And so I had the ge geography. Um, I was, I remember voting for Richard Nixon. <laughs> in, in that, it was the first time I voted. I voted for Richard Nixon as a, as a senior at Harvard College. And I think it was, I think it had to do with a number of things. Um, I started reading newspapers as a kid. I sold newspapers as a kid. And my mother had a subscription to the Christian Science Monitor. And I read it every day. And I remember that election. And I think the reason, I was thinking back, I think the reason I voted for Nixon was that I learned, uh, I picked up on the, the campaign in West Virginia and the enormous amount of money that, that flowed into that campaign from the Kennedys. And uh, I was upset about that. However, I remember when Kennedy was assassinated, and I'll get to that, but uh, I was deeply stirred by his inaugural address, particularly the words of, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And I think that had a, a powerful uh, influence on a decision I made to uh, apply for and uh, gain admission to a precursor program for the Peace Corps called Teachers for East Africa. And I flew out to East Africa with 153 other Americans in July of 1961. And I remember feeling totally proud that Kennedy was in the White House. And he communicated, he communicated youth, energy, and idealism uh, in a way that was, uh, was an inspiration to me. Uh, I was on my way from my I, I had a little, a little house that faced the Kikuyu Reserve near Nairobi at a place called the Alliance High School, a Protestant mission school. And I was on my way from my house to a classroom when a schoolboy stopped me to say that Kennedy had been assassinated. And I was, and am still, deeply distressed. 
at that assassination. And although the Kennedys had money and had influence and had glamour, uh, and money played a part in the projection of the Kennedy name and appeal and image. Uh, there was something about Jack Kennedy that uh, uh, I found attractive. I loved his wit, I loved his charm, I loved his laughter, I loved the way he interfaced with the press. He seemed intelligent, uh, independent, and his death, uh, I felt, uh, marked and changed and altered and darkened our history and our prospects and our future. Well, there it is, that's my remark. I'm, uh, I was a, for a time a Democrat, I'm now an independent. Anybody want to say where they were at the time? Yeah, I'll say where I was, I was still 2.15 and I was in the middle of a class teaching American History of Johnson. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> so it's, uh, it, was, uh, it was, I found he said, well, maybe this is the time of teaching, time to teach, talk about what happened. But, uh, and uh, so I, I've got to tell you that um, long before that, I was a, sort of a political junkie anyway, and I taped all his press conferences because I thought he was so good on the draw. He had, the way he answered questions is better than anybody I know. I, I guess an example, uh, a month before his assassination, the press corps asked him, uh, we noticed that Barry Goldwater is running for president in 1964, would, would you care to comment? And Kenny said, well, I just noticed that on Monday he insulted, he insulted the King of Greece. And then in Tennessee he came out against the Tennessee Valley Authority. And then he came, came out against Social Security in Florida on Friday. So, I, so he said, it's, he's had such a bad week, it's not fair for me to comment. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I noticed about the film, and I was very young at, at the time, but I was intrigued how Kennedy was able to redefine the issue of a strong military buildup, with Eisenhower being in the White House, being a retired general, a uh, war hero, president of the United States for eight years, somehow. Eisenhower was then painted as just asleep at the switch. Any comments on that? Any thoughts on that? Well, I I can say you know I uh, wasn't old enough to vote at the time. I uh, am a lifelong Democrat, but it's striking again that uh, so much you know even in the Kennedy campaign was almost totally based on misrepresentations and fabric fabrications. The missile gap was a fabrication. Um, the, the thing about uh, does he have Addison's disease, I, I, I was trying to parse that quote to see, you know, his brother said he does not have what is classically defined as Addison's disease. And what I was wondering was, well, is there, is there something to that word classically that would rescue that from being a total falsehood to simply uh, a weaselly way of, uh, of phrasing it? But, uh, but much of what was going on, and uh, there's no question that uh, the Republican campaign engaged in the same kind of thing, but uh, it seems that there was a lot less uh, challenge by the press than what we uh, what we see today even though most of us or many of us who are consumers of the news and watch the press think well they're not really uh, challenging the assertions of this side or, or the other side um, 
I think it was uh, even much less that way uh, in the uh, 1950s and 60s. What was, it, what was his comment about Hubert Humphrey that he was a draft archer? People were laughing so loud I couldn't hear anything. He, he, had, he had FDR's son uh, spread the rumor that uh, Humphrey had dodged the draft during the war. And it gave him the opportunity to travel around West Virginia saying, well, it would be terrible for anyone to suggest that Hubert Humphrey was a draft dodger. And repeatedly saying that each time, of course, repeating the idea. <laughs> so I'm calling him a draft dodger without actually saying that. Yes. Denying it, but reinforcing yes. it at the same time. Left-handed couples, yeah. What was um, Hubert Humphrey a draft dodger? I was always under the impression that he was a, too old to be in World War II. Well, that's a good question. I don't, uh, I don't know how old he was. Because uh, I don't know what the, <coughs> I'm not, I don't have a copy of uh, Hubert Humphrey's resume with me. <laughs> would, would you say, like, watching the film for me, I, I was born in 1960, so of course, kind of grew up with him being in office and some of the tragedies that happened, but that that was really the first spin where politics changed and the course of campaigns of the non-truth. I mean, he, he had a wonderful presence of how he presented things. But before then, it seemed like it was a little bit more factual when people were campaigning against one another and they were more spinners than had been in the past. Do you think that hmm. the campaigning started to change during the Kennedy era that has also forwarded how we are today? I've done a little study of Lincoln. I'm not a scholar. I'm a student, a serious student. And I've, I've reviewed the speeches that he made in southern Illinois oh. on, issues of, on issues of slavery. Uh -huh. And, and uh, I looked this word up last night, miscegenation. Oh, wow. It, and I got it right. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, you know, Lincoln, Lincoln had a, a message, one message in southern Illinois and a, another message mm -hmm. in, in northern Illinois. And, and anyone that knows, well, Illinois as a state is a, is a kind of, it's an up and down state. And uh, the folks in, in uh, southern Illinois is kind of are related to the folks in Kentucky and Missouri. There's a real, there's, you know, that's, I'm an SIU grad. Yeah, I know. You know anything about that? Yeah, it's it's very different. So it really, you know, and has it changed? I mean, what about the what about the no. uh, what about the uh, the bitter uh, rivalry between uh, Jefferson and, and Adams, and the uh, Sedition Acts, mm -hmm. and uh, and the, I think there was 30, 35 ballots in the House of Representatives to elect Jefferson with, with one vote, and I think the vote was from a Vermont a congressman, Ma Matthew Lyon, that elected. Uh, it's been, <coughs> politics are savage, and they've been savage, it seems to me, since the beginning of the Republic. As I was, as I was sort of listening to this thing, I was thinking to myself, okay, I was, um, I was actually took my graduate, uh, math exam the day that Kennedy was assassinated. Oh. But, but, but back then, I, at that moment, I, we, I, we were very much, I was married, and we, uh, so it was very much, you know, it, doing my own thing. <coughs> and, and I really didn't wake up politically until 1968. So the question is the flow of history. This is almost was saying that Kennedy was a precursor of the baby boom generation, and it took taking over. In, in, in the late 60s, early 70s, which had to do with much of things, but uh, and that, is, that, is, that, is that what's going on? Is it, to, to what extent does the early 60s get out? Well, I, I don't want to, I, I just want to make one little comment. When I got back from East Africa, I lived in New York City. It was 1968, and Nelson Rockefeller was running for governor. And uh, there were so many 
there were so many pamphlets out on this. I mean, the pamphleteering on the streets of Greenwich Village was so intense that the sidewalks were covered with Nelson Rockefeller material. And he, you know, he won that election. I think, I think there was a change and a shift. I think politics has, has been savage since the beginning, I, with the possible exception of, uh, I think, uh, George Washington. And we had, a, we had really a single, George Washington was, uh, there was, uh, there was, there was uh, he was anti-party. Washington was anti-party. But very soon, after Washington became president, there was a split, and there were two parties. I don't think I don't think the election of George Washington was. I think that was quite a unique, quite a unique moment in electioneering. But I, what, what do you think, Bill? Do you think, or uh, Jack? Would would you agree with me? I I may be wrong on that on that election of Washington. Oh, it was unanimous in the in the electoral college. He could have been king. <laughs> he literally could have yeah, been king. Yeah. But he didn't want that. <laughs> right. Um, I, I think you make a good point. Clearly, a lot of people did not, a lot of the people who were growing up and were young adults in the 1960s, really you wouldn't call them baby boomers. They were a little, a little, sort of on the tri leading edge or just before the baby right. boom was coming of age. Yeah. But it, Kennedy's presidency clearly inspired uh, millions of people to think that there were possibilities that uh, that could be done. You know, the Peace Corps, the uh, people volunteering uh, uh, in Vista, people uh, everywhere you looked, it seemed that people were inspired to uh, to do great things. It's well, that that other that guy, there. oh, Bill Clinton, exactly. There's that famous picture of Bill Clinton meeting uh, Kennedy at the White House. Yeah. You're on a campaign stop. No, this is the White House. Okay. He's a teenager. Okay. The word inspiration was mentioned that uh, Kennedy inspired people all throughout the world, the Peace Corps. And um, he, he really understood better than most, even his father, the, the Hitler threat and why he was left. He always seemed to know the big picture. And, and that's why. Uh, and even when uh, he said, you know, Democrat and Republican presidents always seem to go with prevailing people in power, no matter how despotic they are. But he, Kennedy looked beyond that. The people might, the people are 18 or 20 living, the dispossessed in Africa and Asia and, and uh, in South America. So, I mean, he, he understood that much better than most presidents. Mm -hmm. And I, I also thought that, that uh, I, I really compare him to Lincoln because Lincoln himself saw the big picture on the issue of slavery. No one presented the case for slavery better than the Gettysburg Address. Or against slavery. Against slavery. Mm -hmm. was, yeah, when, when, I was, when we were doing some volunteer work in the Mississippi Delta, got to go into a lot of these um, houses, black families, right on the chimney, the, 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 the mantelpiece pictures of Martin Luther King and JFK. This is in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were still there. Yep. Still there. Yeah. And well, the families were in the, in the town where I grew, all the, grew up, you would regularly see the Pope and JFK on the wall. You know, well, there's, Catholic family, Catholic. Well, so the Lyndon Johnson knew very little about the politics of Southeast Asia. Uh, he didn't want to be. Well, we don't know. You don't want to go into that. I'll take us all night. Uh, Kennedy was called by somebody who was at a foreign legion convention a month before he was assassinated as to why he was pulling out of Southeast Asia. Somebody who's local who has since passed on, so I can't go interview. But he said this in a very public forum that we're not going to go into Southeast Asia. Shortly after that, he was dead. Lyndon Johnson, who did not really understand or was somewhat leery of this whole thing, was talked into it by a bunch of eggheads who says, We're smarter than you on this stuff and do it. And he wasn't smart enough to say, Well, I'm so stupid, I ain't going to do it. And the ended up in Vietnam. 
They've been in Vietnam since the Truman administration, by the way, but little bits and pieces. And uh, still now, you can get in a big army. What were we in Vietnam for? You still don't know why. What for? As yeah. uh, uh, Corporate Dahl says, if we went in there to steal their goods and rape their women, it would have been immoral, but it would have made sense. And what were we there for? It made no sense whatsoever. Shoot off a lot of armaments, murder a few million people. Eh? Well, just an illustration of the, the big picture that we took earlier. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, he, he, uh, he, he, against the wishes of his party, against his father, he was told not to go to Texas. Don't let everyone know you uh, and raise the, the Catholic Protestant issue. Just don't go down there. I thought that was a, a great speech, but that was the kind of thing he could do because he had, seemed to have some a sense of how it was to to lead. He's a leader. He um, regularly in in this film and in uh, the previous hour, um, which traces you know his youth and earlier career. Um, one of the themes that is clearly a part of his life is being rebellious, standing up, taking publicly uh, uh, unpop potentially unpopular positions. You know, we saw him here uh, going after uh, Jimmy Hoffa in that uh, Senate hearing. You know, we, uh, as an undergraduate, he uh, publicly opposed his uh, father's position on uh, going to war in, in Europe. Um, he sensed that separating himself from the Democratic leadership in, in the Senate would be useful to him, and he doesn't seem to have paid uh, a political price for any of those things, and, or any loss of, of his father's support for his career from having done that. Now, you've had your hand up for a while. This is a very, it's the right word, but I don't know how it's a cathartic. Mm -hmm period right now for me in a number of ways. One of which is that um, now my sister was on a plane, probably the same one you took over, but she took it over two years later because she was in the first Peace Corps, actual Peace Corps group to go into to, to Africa. And so 50 years later, I've just finished a term of service in AmeriCorps. The Bridge newspaper, which I think is such an important I don't want to see institution, but such a treasure in this community and the changes that, are, you know, that the bridge has witnessed in 20 years and the people that have been a part of this community, I think a large part of it may have been laid. In part, it would be interesting to look at that maybe is what, what kind of, what kind of um, impetus might have come about because of Kennedy and some groundwork that may have been laid there that might have contributed to changes that, you know, that the bridge may have been a part of, I don't know. Well, he grew up with many sisters, that, that was a help. And uh, just last week, the Democratic victory in Virginia was because of the women's vote. It, now there are more women in the House of Representatives in Vermont than men. And, uh, and Congress has been criticized for a lot of things, but one thing they did very well was they said there should be equal number of dollars between men and women for sports, because allowing them to play sports allowed them to go to college. And that was an entree, that was a huge, oh, was huge. Uh, Piece of legislation. My yeah. had no conception, no idea what it was like, you know, then that women did work in sports and everybody leaves the schools around us. Has I think the big untold story of our of the last fifty years, and I'm not certain why it's why it's not been told. It's been glanced at. It's not really been told. Is the emergence of women. And 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 uh, that's a dramatic, dramatic, dramatic change in politics, in ideas, in art. It, it's, the most, it's the most stunning change that our lives have witnessed over the past 50 years, in my view. And I think a lot of the struggles, uh, uh, a lot of the struggles in the world uh, are less about oil and more about the ways that people relate to each other as in, uh, as in family life and in the education of women 
and in the, the role of women politically. So that's, that's a huge enveloping story that, that hasn't really, partly because the press has been largely guys, I think. Well, the time that you were in Harvard, women weren't even allowed to go to Harvard. Yeah, well, you know, you had go to Catholic, you couldn't go to Harvard. Well, I think people recognize today the, the power of women and, and their contributions. I mean, most people know that 53% of college students are women. Um, my experience is that uh, women speak better in, in the classroom, <laughs> are better students, and uh, I much prefer to work with them because they, they have more of a work, kind of a work ethic that some men don't have. <laughs> so, uh, so I, I mean, I think people are, are, are aware of what, today, the, the power of women. I want to question the power of women. And I see the rash of anti-women bills for that, like Wisconsin and so on. And they're, they're, they're getting shafted left and right all over the country with uh, turnbacks, if you will, mm -hmm. of many of our liberating rules and attitudes toward women. I think you make a good point. I think that uh, it's tremendously variable uh, by geography. And what I think we see is people uh, with a certain mindset and, uh, you know, whole cultural and social and religious ideas and political ideas feel that they're, they've really been under attack for decades. You know, we've been talking tonight as though there have been a lot of good things that have happened in the last 50 years, and I truly believe that. But I think if you go out there in other parts of the country, they don't necessarily agree that the changes in the last 50 years have, have been for the better. and. And so I think you're absolutely right. There is still a lot of uh, backlash. And I, I, I agree exactly with you very much. But I do think that in this particular state, that we have a woman who's been reelected twice, who's taken a leading role in moving the move, women's movement forward. And so it's true. Uh, that's not true in Alabama and Mississippi. But at least it's nice to live in a state where you've, you've had known leadership by women and been very successful leadership. I just don't think you can ever become idle on anything in progress because if you don't stay on it, we do go backwards because we go back into patterns. But what I, what I also found interesting watching and having grown up because I was small with Kennedy is that comparing him to Clinton, it's interesting to see the similarities or the characteristics that Bill Clinton picked up from Kennedy. I mean, it, it out of all the individuals I saw between that growing up, I would say that Clinton reminds me a lot of Kennedy in terms of the charisma and the characteristics that he carried. Um, and I haven't seen anybody really sense him. And the love of the game. Too. And, and do it as well. I mean, would you agree with that or disagree? No, I think there's a direct connection to leadership. Uh, Clinton and Kennedy had leadership qualities. Mm -hmm. I totally way up agree. Here. You know, the political instincts, you know, there are a lot of ways you can look at American life, I think. And when, when you think about presidents, um, there are certain presidents that obviously enjoy being president and had a lot of fun with it. Uh, Kennedy clearly enjoyed being president and had a lot of fun with it. Uh, Clinton really enjoyed being president and had a lot of fun with it. Johnson and Nixon did not. It, it was purgatory for them the whole time they were there for obvious reasons. FDR, the whole time, even even in the terrible times he was in it, clearly enjoyed being president. And I think people relate to that. People find that appealing. When I think of Johnson, I see him reaching in the back of his pocket to find out what the recent poll in Vietnam is. <laughs> well, Johnson is, oh, go ahead. Well, I was going to. Uh, this film uh, stops with Kennedy becoming president. It doesn't venture into the presidency itself. It doesn't touch on the, uh, there's plenty of footage on the assassination and the aftermath of the assassination. It doesn't touch on the, uh, I think it was the Warren Commission that uh, 
that wrote the report that was embraced, I guess, by official Washington as the report of the assassination. Um, I, I, I borrowed a book from this library that uh, was a complex argument, meaning analysis of the assassination and of the events leading up to the assassination and of the forces at play. And uh, I don't remember the name of the book, but I can get you the name of the book. But it concludes that the Warren Commission's report was untruthful and that Kennedy was murdered uh, by, uh, he had offended, he had offended some very powerful, some very powerful forces, had been offended, took exception, <laughs> found him dangerous and murdered him. That's what the book concludes. I just wonder what people think on that, on that not, not happy subject. <laughs> it's not a happy subject. I, I just tell my class when I had, I showed this film in my class last week. I said, all, everything's open, but we're going to talk about Kennedy. We're not going to talk about the, mod, the mode of assassination because we could take the whole class up on assassinations. Uh -huh. the, job, the, the purpose of this film is about leadership. Right. Well, okay, and I, you know, I yield to you on that, but I, the, there is a theme that runs, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit contrarian, but great respect to you, Bill. I think there's a theme of Kennedy being a bit independent, not taking orders following his own star. And I think he may well have done that as president, and he may have paid a price for that. We don't have to discuss, we don't have, certainly we don't have to discuss the assassination. No, we're well, he together, was a we're social that justice. Point. <laughs> he did, he was really what we call today a social justice leader. I'm sure he lived in a household that had to be very difficult for him because I don't think his family were particularly social justice individuals. You know, they were motive, they, they had the lineage. But he really did, if, I think given to his druthers without the family, the father in particular, would probably be considered a, a, a large social justice person today. I, I mean, I could be wrong on that, but that's how I look at him. Well, I think that's true. I'm not, I, I'm not sure I agree with your idea about the family. And what really struck me um, with all the uh, coverage when his uh, brother, uh, Ted Kennedy died several years ago, is that uh, the parents had clearly instilled Some the idea like of service very deeply in that whole family. And you see what they've done, what, how it's been carried down mm -hmm. to, their, uh, to the next generation. I, I think it's there, and I think it came from, from the father. The now, dining room, hand up over here. I just want to comment. Okay. The dining room was, was a seminar a great seminar for the young people growing up, and they, they, they grew up as exceptional people. Now you had your hand up. Well, I was just going to mention, I recently completed a book. Uh, it was John F. Kennedy's Last 100 Days, mm. and it does refer mostly to what he was handling during that period of time. And he certainly did have a lot of enemies within. Uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he didn't always pay any attention to them. Um, he didn't follow their advice. He also had made some secret overtures to both uh, Castro <laughs> and uh, Khrushchev. He was trying to develop a peaceful government, and he was looking forward to that in his second term. And if anybody got hold of that, that he was trying to be friendly with Khrushchev and Castro, that probably didn't set too well in some circles. That's well, what I've read anyway. Making overtures to Castro would certainly be consistent with uh, his uh, Senate uh, analysis of the Algerian situation, which is that we really can't be in a position where we're supporting the imperialists, we're supporting the uh, uh, against the uh, people of the country. Um, unfortunately, that's what the policy of the United States was in Vietnam during that time. I believe uh, that was. Uh, if you saw the uh, video of, of the men going through and going up the stairs, I believe that one of the people we saw going by was Camus. Mm. Um, <coughs> huh. but, uh, Name? Albert Camus. Oh. Going up what stairs? Uh, when they were covering the Algerian uh, situation. Uh -huh. it, it looked like him to me. I think that was, 
he and he was publicly in favor of the Arab cause at, uh, well, at that time. Some, uh, miscellaneous French Camus French. impersonator, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't pick Camus out well from Camus. Camus okay. One of the things that struck uh, one of the things that I think about in Vietnam gets me to that is, uh, you know, for one thing, everything that people think of as being a credit to Kennedy, you know, advance of civil rights, Medicare, Medicaid, and all those things. The person who actually accomplished all of that was Johnson, not mm -hmm. Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And that combined with, uh, with Vietnam really makes Johnson tragic. one of the most tragic figures in American history. Yeah. Because he could have been a great, great president had it not been for Vietnam. In fact, I was saying this, uh, I was at a funeral uh, a year or so ago and saying this exact same line almost in these words to, uh, to a guy I just met who was, uh, happened to be a black lawyer at Legal Aid of Western Michigan where I used to work. And he said, well, as far as I'm concerned, he was a great president. Mm -hmm. He did more for me than anybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, Mitch. Um, I, I guess I've had a panorama of thoughts watching the film and listening to the discussion. Um, I, I guess growing up, I was ambivalent about Kennedy a little bit. I remember in seventh grade, um, was, I guess when he was assassinated, and they rounded up all the kids and everything. And uh, at that time, I guess I've always been a little bit of an anti-elitist. So um, I think you know, the Camelot was a little bit too much for me. Watching the film, I, I have a much greater admiration for him. And mm -hmm. as a segue to that, you know, as far as the overtures to uh, Castro and Khrushchev, I remember reading that a lot of his advisors were very militant, and that he was basically a stabilizing force as far as us not getting into a, a conflict with uh, the Soviet Union. So, this is about the same time as Dr. Strangelove. Yeah, it yeah. followed off that, yeah. Has anyone visited the Kennedy uh, Museum and Library down in Boston? <laughs> strongly encourage you to do that. I think it's a very powerful uh, thing. And one of, one of the things you see going through there is, uh, is, is the promise that was uh, never to be fulfilled. You can actually hear, uh, I think they actually, uh, correct me on this, Jack, but I think they actually have tapes of uh, Kennedy talking via phone to George Wallace. Hmm. I don't remember that, but I wouldn't be surprised. But the, the library's produced wonderful films hmm. about Kennedy, probably the best collection in the world. Well, Kennedy was in around the beach. There's something about the Pigs incident. That turned out badly, and it turns out that this uses a uh, model in management studies is that he was at all the meetings of planning that and it turns out that they were all yes men and they weren't talking to each other, they were just talking to him and it turned out badly. So he changed his management style and spent a lot of time away from the, the, the big table and hmm. let them talk amongst themselves. Uh, well, it was a, FDR did that too and then he would uh, it's unusual for somebody to completely change their management style uh, as opposed to like Richard Nixon who had one way of doing things and he did it until he was like shown the door. Yep. If it could, um, just another aspect of it is the literary piece. Um, he's, for me, is probably one of the most, and I'm no kind of scholar, I'm like my dad said, I'm kind of a student, a little bit of a serious student, but as a writer, I guess, um, is the literate, literate piece that he brought to to the presidency. Yeah. Profiles of courage. Oh, yeah. The whole thing, you know, it's just mm -hmm. his appreciation, of Robert Frost at the inaugural. Right. Um, but to segue off of that one is a personal anecdote. It's one of my next door neighbors was Taylor Branch. Um, mm -hmm. So Taylor Branch and George Cryle. So what I did was I transcribed the tapes that they did a series of interviews with uh, the Cubans, and it was called the Cuban Connection. Hmm. So that was really kind of fun. It was, you know, dictaphone stuff and trying to listen to what they were saying at the same time they're doing, you know, dictating on a, you know, restaurant or on the airplane. 
but um, over the years, as Taylor Branch you know, has grown and George Carl has grown as writers and as historians, you know, what they've done in the last 50 years. Um, and I just remember them starting off you know, with the, the Cuban Connection and that series of interviews and the books that, the book that they put out at that time. So were these some of the Cubans who were involved in the Bay of Pigs invasion or just ordinary Cubans living in Cuba? Um, no, one's more involved and then, you know, the assassination angle as well that uh -huh. went into it, you know, because of the anger with Kennedy and his stance in the Cuban community in Miami. And so those the series of interviews they did in the book that they came out with. We probably have time for one more question. Mitch, go ahead. Okay, just uh, three quick thoughts, I guess. Uh, Kennedy had a lot in common, or had something in common with Roosevelt, FDR, as far as the Addison's disease versus polio. Mm -hmm. um, a second thought is uh, that basically, I remember my parents telling me and how fast a reader he was. He was able to read all of these newspapers very quickly before a day even started. And about Johnson, the complex relationship that they had, Johnson actually brought his legacy to fruition. But at the same time, he they, there was a huge animosity, and also Johnson was mentioned in a lot of conspiracy theories. So it's everybody laughed when that picture was up of Johnson. That and one, Kennedy. that really, <laughs> the was very telling. The photography told the story. You wouldn't even have to hear words if you looked at some of those photographs. Yeah. Yeah. they were so poignant. <sighs> Johnson looked like he was goosing Kennedy. <laughs> I want to thank you very much for agreeing to be our panel this evening. Your comments were wonderful, as well as all of yours. I really appreciate it. This was a very important time in all of our lives, and we were, mm -hmm. I think we all remember where we were, and uh, maybe not you. <laughs> <laughs> and I really appreciate that, that we got to share this tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.